I know, I know. And I need to have a little word about Pyre's patches. Since the intestinal system is an ideal portal for entry of antigens, and antigens is the bad stuff, right? The stuff we don't want. We have a huge amount of cells. 70 to 80% of all antibody producing cells are spread throughout the GI system. And those are in lymphatic follicles that are either singly or they're grouped together. Those, in, those organized follicles are found in the mucosa of the ileum, a lot of the ileum. And we find in there, we find, we call them Peyer's patches. And also within the vermiform appendix. Oh, so your appendix actually has some purpose. So we see those a lot in there too. So, and, and what you see here is you, you see a cross, a cross of a piece in the ileum. You see lymphatic follicles like uh, the Peyer patches right here. They, uh, uh, for, they arch like domes between different villi that go up and down. Here's a, here's a, a frontal section. No, this is just a picture. Uh, um, uh, very small stuff, very pretty. So you see the pears patches right here, and then here are the villi that are around it. And so the pears patch is like a dome that goes into the lumen of the GI tract. And then these Pears patches are uh, organized and have different cells in it. They have M cells in them, and they recognize an antigen and take it up or eat that antigenic substance. And then they pass those along to macrophages, and those become antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells. Remember, we call them this from the immune system. And then, in turn, these activated macrophages, these APC cells, they activate the T cells, the T helpers, and then the T helpers activate the B cells. And so, the B cells then migrate, activated B cells migrate through the lymph and the blood in producing different antibodies, the ones that they do called IgAs. And then those, tr those antibodies travel to the liver to reach the intestine again via the bile. Because as you will see, we'll talk about the bile a little bit, but bile is made by the liver, is stored by the gallbladder, is, is then it injected into the intestinal system via the pancreas, that in the intestinal system, it, 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 it goes in the fat droplets and makes them really small and emulsifies the fat, so we can then absorb the fat, because fat in water tends to aggregate, tends to clump together, like salad dressing and oil and salad dressing. You see that there. But then that's a good mechanism because we can have the, the antigens, I mean the antibodies, travel through the liver and be brought back into the intestinal system via the bile and then act on similar looking antigens right before they even enter anything. And they prevent them from entering. And so that's really a great system, I think. Mother's milk also passes on passive immunity uh, of encountered antigen through the nursing infant. So the IgAs, those also go through the mother's milk. They get also uh, brought through there. So that's kind of nice. And then further, plasma cells within the pear patches secrete IgAs, these antibodies, into the intestine uh, um, 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 uh, as well. Then they combine with the co corresponding antigen there from that angle. And again, this way they cannot be absorbed but they will be excreted. So that's kind of a cool system of how we can function, and how the immune system functions. I know it's kind of complicated, but at least this way you have sort of a short version of how it works, and if you go further in your study, you can reach back to it if, it, if, it, you know, if it's more complicated. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. And that brings us to the large bile. So the ileum empties into the cecum at the ileocecal valve. And the vermiform appendix hangs off of it like a pouch, uh, is like the first section off of that large intestine. So that's like right here. Here's the ilio, the appendix. And the ileocecal valve comes into here, it's not shown right here. But that's, we've seen it on this other slide, let's see. We've seen it right here. The ileum is finishing up. Here's the ileocecal valve area. That's the cecum. And then the appendix is coming up and hanging off on the end here. All right. Go back to that. And so then the large intestinal, it does it ascends. It goes upward just to about the liver. 
which is on the right side, in the right upper quadrant, which we'll talk about next, and it goes up to that area and it makes a turn, and that's called the right colic flexor. It makes a turn and goes across right underneath the diaphragm. I mean, underneath the uh, yeah diaphragm as well, but rib cage for us to feel, um, and that's the transverse colon, and there it makes another term called the left colic flexor and it goes down and descends into an S-shaped portion at the end here the sigmoid colon and that's within the pelvis then we get we get straight down again and that's called the rectum and it feeds into the anal canal before it leaves through the anus on the outside when we look at uh, when we look at the outside of the structure, we see some longitudinal muscle bands that are called tinea coli, and they have like these fatty tags hanging off of this stuff. And the fatty tags are called epiploic appendages, and uh, we can see those. Contraction of the circular muscles that are here, circular or here, actually what we can see as a result are the house trusts, these little houses that got created, these little pouch pieces here. So that's that's what that's what we call that house truss. So that's the large intestine right there. And the mucosa in there, the inside layer of the large intestine does not have villi, but what we do there is we have water and salt absorbed through micro villi. And we have many mucus secreting goblet cells present there. Because we also have a lot a lot of commensals. And commensals are good bacteria that help decompose indigested food items. And so we actually have a lot of bacteria in our gut that we need. And you can see that if you if you have antibiotics that you take, we have to take antibiotics once in a while, and you do not take um, a probiotic with it, you will have very loose stool, very likely, and some diarrhea, most likely. Because you're getting rid of the good bacteria in the gut also. You don't just get rid of the bad bacteria. We can't differentiate that. Well, sometimes, but not as well as we wanted to. Uh, and so, we, if we don't rep replenish the good bacteria with, with prebiotics or probiotics, um, um, then we, we will not absorb the water as well and the salt, and therefore we will have more liquid stool. And so that's why you want to take probiotics or prebiotics um, when you have antibiotics that, that you need to take. Sometimes yogurt is good enough for that. Okay, let's have a little bit more of a discussion about movements. We have two types of movements that are present in the large bowel. We have peristaltic waves of mixed food remnants. And secondly, the intestinal content is transported by mass movements towards the rectum. So sometimes you see that all of a sudden, oops, now you got to go. And the anus, when we look at the anus, it is closed by an internal sphincter. That's a thickening of some circular muscle layer. And then an external sphincter, and that's a striated voluntary muscle. That's voluntary control. That's when you can say, oh, I got to wait. I can't go right now. And when you're a baby, you have a diaper because you can't hold that yet. And so we have to learn how to do that, that voluntary part. The pelvic floor musculature is also crucial for stable of the core. And so it's very important um, uh, 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 to sometimes, when we look at the core, we talk about the core is the, 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 the transverse musculature around the gut. And that's a round part. And the bottom and the top of the, that area also needs to be made solid. Uh, if we want to have a stable core, and we wanted a stable core, so we 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 move from a stable part of the body, uh, and that's more protective for all the joints. Um, but the pelvic floor is a very important part of the core. So for some people, they need to do Kegel exercises. And if you want to look up Kegel exercises, you find some YouTube videos that help you understand what that how that how to do that. And if for um. And so that's, and then of course the pelvic floor musculature also is there to help support the external sphincter uh, as well uh, uh, in terms of the exit of the anal canal. The peritoneum is another piece of discussion. We talked about in the respiratory system, about the serous membrane system quite extensively, and inside, in, in the 
in 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 the uh, gut in the abdominal cavity we also have a membrane and that's the peritoneum um, and we have a visceral and the parietal peritoneum and organs are surrounded by the visceral layer and then suspended from the posterior wall via suspensory ligament so this system is a little more complicated in terms of its look than the one in the lungs and the heart that is just simple to understand. Here we have ligaments that are attached in the back here, in the back wall, and they suspend those uh, um, uh, surrounded organs via viscera, via the visceral peritoneum, because the visceral, per, you know, the, the, the gut is a, is a lot of stuff, it's a lot of tubing. And so this way we can organize where the gut lies. It's actually a nice way of doing it. Uh, it's just a little more complicated to understand um, uh, and, and get the labeling right. But here, here are some of the names. The suspensory ligament or the mesentery of the small intestine, the mesocolon, and the greater and the lesser omentum. Omenta, as the plural. You can see them labeled in this area here. I'm not going to worry about that too much, but you can look it up. Uh, uh, the retroperitoneal organs are organs that lie behind the peritoneal cavity, and they are not as protected as organs that lie within the peritoneal cavity and are all nicely anchored in, in, and organized. So those are the kidneys, the pancreas, parts of the duodenum, and the ascending and descending colon. And, and the, the kidneys, they are protected by a fatty tissue, so they have some protection, but they can be a little bit shaken up when we have car accidents and so forth. So sometimes when they get shaken up, they take an x-ray of the kidneys to see if they're well, they first take some urine to see if there is any urine in the urine, I mean blood in the urine, and if there is, they're going to take an extra of the kidney and see uh, if they're functioning okay. And this brings us to the pancreas. We already talked briefly about the pancreas in terms of its functioning. Um, it is the most important digestive gland that secretes about two liters of pancreatic juice a day into the duodenum. And so this is. This is what it does besides the insulin to glucagon. So this is pancreatic juice. This is actually the exocrine part uh, function of this gland because the inside of the gut tube is considered the outside of the body in terms of the glands discussion. The head of the um, <coughs> pancreas, this head is right here, it lies in, in a C-shaped loop of the duodenum, which is the pinkish stuff that goes around it. And the body comes after that, and then the tail reaches into the spleen more. The pancreatic juice is very alkaline rich. It's very rich in, in bicarbonate ions. It can pick up a lot of that acidic stuff that comes in from the uh, stomach, from the, the chyme, which is, uh, it neutralizes that. And then it has many enzymes that digest the fat, the proteins, and the carbohydrates. The gland is partially controlled by the vagus nerve, which comes from the brain stem out from, from, from the brain and goes down and reaches different organs physically. Uh, and then it partly is, is uh, uh, controlled by the two mucosal hormones, so, so secretine and cholecystokinin. And they come from the duodenum. And so what they do is they, they get, either they make more uh, pancreatic juice or not. And they get triggered by the amounts of fattens and pH that's present. So that's, um, that's a hormonal system. So that, that is actually hormones that go through the bloodstream and then talk to the pancreas that way. Seems a little inefficient if it's right next to each other, but it's definitely a, a good way of doing it. And that gets us to the liver. Uh, the liver is the largest 